Good afternoon to everybody. Um, I must say that I'm extremely pleased uh, to chair this uh, parallel session in the European uh, Green Party Council. Um, maybe I can say a few words of myself and also of the reason why we have this uh, uh, this panel. So my name is Bula Tsetsi. I am uh, from the Greek origin. I'm an urban planner, but uh, for a, a lot of years until now, I have been the Secretary General of the Greens in the European Parliament and recently member of the Committee of the Greens, uh, uh, the Green Party um, following the South. Uh, the reason why I decided to uh, be candidate and to be in the committee is not because I'm missing the uh, working hours. Um, <laughs> time, but mainly because uh, uh, I believe that politically is extremely important to join forces with the group and also with the national uh, uh, parties, the green parties, to reinforce the presence of uh, the South in, um, uh, in the, the, the presence of green parties in the South. Therefore, uh, the reason why I, I wanted to organize this session is because we know that uh, we're facing extremely difficult times, not only because of the pandemic, not only because of the socioeconomic crisis, not only because of the uh, climate uh, crisis, but also because we face a time of a loss of trust somehow in the European projects with everything we see around us. And the combination of all that makes uh, practically the hope for the European Union, the hope for the recovery funds, the hope for this new era that we are waiting so much, the Green Deal, the post-COVID, and a completely new uh, model of development, much more sustainable and much more, uh, uh, much more, uh, let's say, um, addressed to the needs of the people. And therefore, uh, there is a lot of hope that uh, with uh, negoci the negotiations that the European Union has currently with the recovery funds and the MFF, that we will open a new door and we will open new chances and new challenges uh, to uh, face this uh, multiple crisis. We should also not forget that in some countries, especially in the South, these crises uh, are coming at the moment uh, that they, some of these countries and especially the citizens started to take a breathing space because of the uh, austerity measures and uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, programs uh, linked to the austerity measures after the financial crisis of 2009. And they started somehow to recover. And the moment that they started to recover, then this new crisis jumped in, making, let's say, uh, um, the socioeconomic dimension and uh, uh, much harder with uh, uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, people uh, touching the threshold of the poverty and also a huge unemployment uh, when it comes to the youth and not only. And therefore, um, let's say the voice of successes, the voice of the Greens should be a voice which builds trust, but also reassures that we are able without political project to go towards this transition because you do not create a sustainable development without transitional periods and without really create a new dynamic and a new trust with the population. And um, just before I present the, the different uh, 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 speakers, uh, I would like to say that uh, things, they went indeed very bad, not only because of the financial crisis years ago, not only because of the climate and the economic ecological crisis, but also because the models of the development that for years politicians used, they were very, very wrong. I just give you three examples uh, just to understand that this is not only a matter of money, it's also a matter of political choices. Um, Greece has, uh, and the country which I know most, has 
a, a rate of unemployment among people in July it was 16%, where the average of uh, the European, let's say, average for unemployment was around 8.59%. Uh, so you understand that among uh, the young people, but also among the rest of the population, if uh, close to one fifth of the population has not a future, that's a huge problem. Second, Greece is the country where the electricity, the price of the electricity is the highest in Europe, which is a completely uh, nonsense. And as rightfully so this morning, um, it was also mentioned by Thomas that we are facing more and more energy poverty in crisis in countries where we have a boulevard of opportunities to develop renewables and to uh, develop a much more accessible, uh, let's say, energy and much more cleaner energy. And uh, just to make the last example, my country uh, remains the fourth in the list or among the four countries where the lignitis is in a full explosion. And therefore, it is not only a matter of money, it is a matter of political choices. And in the past, the structural funds, the money from Europe has not always been used in the best possible way. Uh, for example, uh, I remember hardly uh, that we uh, create uh, sustainable jobs and we create uh, uh, really projects and finance projects which may, they make sense. Uh, in the long term and not only in the very short term. Therefore, what it will be interesting for this session is uh, to discuss with you if you really see a real chance that uh, uh, despite the fact that we are in this period of crisis, the multiple crisis, that will become a turning point for a different uh, kind of development, but also uh, a, 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 let's say, a starting point to uh, gain back the trust of the citizens and explain that with our ideas and together with the European Union, we will be able to face their daily problems and their daily life. So in this context, uh, together also with my team, we thought who we can invite uh, in order also to see uh, all this discussion in uh, from different angles. So I would like uh, to present, I uh, would say, on the order that they will uh, speak, uh, the uh, colleagues and uh, uh, the speakers of this session. Uh, so uh, from the group in the European Parliament, we have uh, uh, two colleagues, is from one side is Roku Garobu and also Simone Reinhardt. Both uh, they are uh, expert, political experts in budgetary issues in the negotiations on the MFA and Simone with a very long experience in the regional committee and uh, very, very active on uh, everything related to the committee of the regions, but also to, uh, uh, to, to the cities, uh, to the financing of the different programs and, uh, and a lot of other nice things. And I would like uh, really to thank them because uh, during this period, uh, we know that uh, they uh, work very hard in the framework of these negotiations. Uh, and I know that uh, they take a little bit of their free time to present you what exactly Europe and the group is doing. Then I have a lot of pleasure to uh, present you Bernd Klaus Voss. Uh, he is um, a member of a regional assembly in Germany. I don't even dare to say the name because I will pronounce it very bad. But uh, one extra reason why we are very happy to have you here is because you are the co-chair of the group in the Committee of the Regions. Finally, we managed to have a green group in the Committee of the Regions, so you can give us your perspective in uh, the current debate uh, on uh, and also on the sustainable development. With a lot also of pleasure, I would like to present you Anna Lisa Boni. She is the Secretary General of the Eurocities with a lot of experience, a very big curriculum. And we would like also from your perspective to explain to us how you see the situations and the real, uh, let's say, uh, opportunities that we have to, uh, to use. And last but not least, 
list, we have uh, two mayors, a um, mayor and a deputy mayor. Uh, so very, very concrete, uh, concrete examples of on exactly uh, what's uh, going uh, on. So from one side, we have um, uh, Magdalena Davis. Uh, she is uh, the co-chair of uh, the Czech Greens, but also the mayor of uh, a city close uh, to the capital. And also uh, we have Julia Dumai, who is uh, the deputy mayor of our lovely Strasbourg. And of course, uh, she represents the young generations and also this green wave, uh, which uh, was uh, a, a big success uh, for, uh, for all of us. Um, uh, at a local level in France, which of course creates us a, a, a fantastic hope that uh, uh, we can really have such a success in uh, uh, other countries uh, more close to the south and to the east. So that's the panel and um, I will uh, uh, start with Roku and immediately after with Simone uh, and slowly, slowly, of course, we will uh, connect uh, uh, with you. Uh, we will connect with your questions in order also to be able to try in one and a half hour to uh, answer to, uh, to, to, to the different issues that you will raise. So Roku, the floor is yours and again, a big thank uh, for your presence here. Thank you very much, uh, Vula. I'm Roku Garoubi, policy advisor of the Green CIFA Group in the Parliament, uh, working on the Committee on, on Budget. And uh, we are living interesting times with uh, the multi-annual financial framework negotiations linked to the rule of law, linked to the recovery plan. And, and what I want to, to, to give you as information today is, is many four points. Uh, how to access to the funds, when to influence, how we could contest bad projects and a bit of evolution in the last 10 years uh, and a rather positive evolution actually. So first of all, on access to the fund, you have to know that we have three main ways to spend the money at the EU level. We have what we call the direct management. So that means the commission, the European Commission acting as a government, a central administration, uh, directly manage the fund. So it is used for a certain program like in research like uh, in part of Erasmus program or like in connecting road facility where we have project for transport, energy or, or, or digitalization, it, it, it issues calls. And then it's up to the companies, to the uh, universities, to the researchers, to the people, the people to apply directly to, to the call. And there is a competition uh, between the, 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 the different applications. That's the direct management which is only a piece of the EU budget. The main bulk, and it will be mainly covered by Simone, is, is a shared management. So the shared management, that means the EU level, but also the national level uh, and regional and local levels are co-responsible of the management of the fund. But that means it's, it's more, uh, the, the center of gravity is more the national authority or the regional authority, depending on the setup, administrative and constitutional setup of the member states, but there, the, the, the EU is more working as a check and balances to see the rules are respected, but the center of gravity is rather within the member states. And then we have a third way to um, use funds. It's indirect management, but it's really rarely the case in the EU. It's mainly for third countries where actually the EU delegates to an external uh, body, usually inter international organizations, the, the implementation of the programs, mainly in uh, humanitarian aid, for example. So that, that the main way. So you, when you want to uh, reply to a call to a program, it's really important to know which way we spend the money or the, which management we have, because it's, it's a different uh, way to proceed and it's a different um, person you have to talk to. Uh, what is also important to understand in EU budget is when we need to influence. Of course, a budget is an annual budget. So every year we adopt a new budget and actually yesterday we agreed for next year budget between the parliament, the council and the commission. So every year you can influence a budget. You can spend a bit more on, on good programs, a bit less in, in other programs. You can try to improve, to green certain programs uh, from one year to another year, but it's rather limited. Uh, but there is every year this exercise and the better is to do this exercise already in the spring, the year before, because you have to understand in order to have a budget in January, the whole exercise starts in March, April, by the commission presenting its budget 
and then there is an entire negotiation between the council and the parliament during the fall. So every year you can try to influence in order to improve the, the, the annual budget. But the key element is every seven years, because as you may uh, have heard during uh, the last days, we have the multi-annual financial framework. So basically every seven years, we negotiate a framework for seven years. And then every year we adapt the budget according to this framework and according to the priorities and according to the crisis or the needs. Uh, but the big, the big framework, the big uh, budgetary discussion is every seven years. And this is really important because once we establish this framework, then we adapt we adjust, but there is no fundamental change afterwards during seven years, and it's rather long, seven years. And, and now we are really at the end of this process. It's not completely over, but we are rather at the end of this process. But we don't, we shouldn't understand, I mean, you should understand that it's not the last year that the process to lobby and influence starts. It actually starts three, four years before. For example, the parliament started working on this new MFF for the 21-27 period, already in 2017 and and in a committee of regions or in certain organizations the work started even earlier in order to try to lobby the commission to prepare good programs or better programs and in order to lobby the member states to adopt a good position so this is a seven-year program a framework but uh, uh, the negotiations and the influence and the law lo all lobby exercise starts three four years before and uh, exceptionally this year we have also uh, a recovery plan and this is uh, quite important because it's the first time ever the EU is going to issue bonds to to uh, to finance uh, grants and, and 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 support activity economic activity, and and this is really important because while we are being negotiating the recovery plan, it's still not finalized. It could be in the next days. Then the national plans to support the recovery plan uh, will be presented by the member states before end of April next year and adopted by the Commission before end of June or July next year. So the, the project and the actions which could be covered by the recovery plan are not listed yet. They are being drafted. So at, at the national level mainly, and this is important to be in contact with your national governments uh, on, on this point. Uh, a third point uh, I want to stress is how to contest bad projects because we do support the European integration and the integrate uh, European um, budgetary tools, but we also contest some spendings politically but also legally. And then I think it's rather important for our families to political families to contest when we can contest. And there there are three main ways. The first one is an administrative one in your own member states. According to your legal framework, you can contest programs or projects which do not respect the rules for um, uh, competition law or for not respecting certain uh, principles in, in certain calls. But at the EU level, you have two main ways. One is a legal procedure. So you can use what it is called OLAF, which is the anti-fraud office in Brussels which is there in order to check whether there is no fraud, no corruption case, or no mismanagement of the funds. And, and even uh, anonymously, you can contact OLAF, the anti-fraud office, if you see that there are corruption case or there are uh, mis, uh, misuse of the fund or, or fraud. Um, now we have also the European Public Prosecutor Office, which just has been set up, and it could also be uh, um, used in order to contest some bad projects if you see uh, that some rules have, or laws have been breached. The second process is more political process, is what we have in European Parliament, a petition committee, which is there in order to, when we have a petition, uh, we collect uh, signatures all over Europe and we try to present it in the Parliament. So it's not a legal way to block a project, but it's a political way to put a certain focus on it and certain pressure on it to be sure, to be sure that this is uh, correctly spent or you have another political way, which is an um, ECI, the European Citizen Initiative, and uh, there it's not for the Parliament, it goes to the Commission. But if you collect one million signatures throughout Europe, you can put one question on the table, and it could be also a way to contest not necessarily one specific project, but uh, one specific, uh, one particular, uh, one general um, issue. So you have administrative ways in your member states legal ways in the EU, but also political procedures. And then I would like to, to, to conclude my introduction on 
on, uh, on a certain evolution. You have to know that this current multiannual financial framework, so the seven years we are ending at the end of this month, uh, for the first time ever, we had a climate uh, target. So 20% should have been uh, spent for, for climate over the, the last seven years. Actually, we are going to miss uh, this, this target. And even actually, if we uh, read the European Court of Auditors, which is not uh, uh, composed by a bench of, of uh, fund, uh, fundies from, from the Green parties, even the European Court of Duties, the European Court of Auditors, sorry, contests um, the way it's calculated. So we are going to meet the target, but this is not the most important point I want to stress is for the first time ever, we have got a target for climate. 20% of the EU budget was dedicated to climate. And we, as a political group in the parliament, we have been pushing for the last three years to increasing this share. Initially, our, our, our position as group was to have 50% for climate and all, uh, all climate-related spending. And the compromise we reached in the parliament was around 30%. But we were the only one group pushing for that. There were some individual here or there, or some national delegation from different groups, but we were the only one group. And after three years of exercise, trying to convince the parliament, after the European election, it was uh, finally uh, a success. We could even increase the share by including biodiversity target for the first time ever with 10%. And we successfully convinced some member states and then the council and then the commission, which means that for the first time ever, the next MFF will have target for climate. 30% of the EU budget will be for, for climate. And we are going to have a growing share for biodiversity for the first time ever in order to reach 10%. So what I want to say is, uh, even if we are rather small proportionally in the parliament, we were 7% in the last parliament, we are around 10% now, we are able to influence this decision. And of course, the stronger we are in the parliament or stronger we are in, in the local and regional and national authorities, the better it is for us. And that's why even if it's probably not fast enough, not strong enough, for, for our group. Clearly, there are improvements. And I could even add a last point to conclude. It's not only climate which has been improved, biodiversity, biodiversity which has been created, it's also gender-related spending. For the first time ever, we have now gender-related uh, elements in the next EU budget. And this is also thanks to our group. So that's why being part of this process, it's a long process, I said, three, four years for the MFF. But even with rather small share of, of, of Greens, if I MEPs in the Parliament, we may be successful on some points. I hope that next time we will be even more numerous in the Parliament, in the Council, in a different Council. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raoku. Um, probably what I will suggest is that we follow straight with Simona. And before we go to Bernard, there are a few things that maybe we can, um, I will come back with one or two points, just to make sure that uh, that uh, we we also point out one or two issues that uh, uh, if they have, they will not be raised by, by Simona. Thanks a lot. Simona, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Simone Reinhardt. I work for the Greens EFA Group in the European Parliament on regional development for quite a couple of years and I'm very happy to meet you this afternoon for this session. I will uh, speak about EU funding uh, and uh, link very much up with what uh, Rocco already explained. Um, so thanks for for all the uh, introduction, uh, for all your uh, remarks, uh, Rocco, uh, on this um, general level and uh, maybe it becomes a bit more concrete now. Um, when it comes to EU funding, uh, we are faced with uh, three major challenges uh, today. Uh, one of them is the timing of the adoption of uh, the, the regulations. The other one is uh, the, the COVID-19 crisis and the need for a response to be given through the EU budget and through e uh, EU funding. And the third one is obviously uh, very close to, to us, uh, the climate change. Uh, so our uh, request to avoid harmful spending and to focus on climate proof spending. Uh, what's going to come in the in the near future, according to um, to what we've seen in the negotiations, um, because of the delayed uh, adoption of the of the regulations that are underpinning e each fund under the EU budget, um, we are facing other risk of a funding gap 
in order to avoid such a funding gap, um, a bridging solution was found um, for most of the funds so that meanless, a seamless funding can be provided. Um, but uh, this funding stream is mainly meant as crisis response. So it's not exactly the same funding that we know uh, from mainstream uh, EU funds. Um, the a crisis response is mainly intended to provide indeed liquidity to provide for funding opportunities to the member states and the regions and uh, not to set high ambitions and a high investment standards. At the same time, uh, the member states and also their authorities, they have to set up kind of a double structure, one structure for the crisis response funding stream and another structure for uh, the, the regular uh, funding. So uh, this is also quite stressful uh, time for, uh, for the authorities. The uh, response uh, to the COVID-19 uh, crisis is obviously extremely important and it uh, should consist, uh, first of all, of a response to address the health sector. Uh, secondly, uh, to provide for a new kind of mechanisms uh, in case of future crisis so that the EU can react quicker then it is currently the, 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 the case uh, and take specific uh, measures in order to respond to whatever crisis uh, situation. So new uh, elements have come in on uh, during the ongoing negotiations in order to be more resilient uh, in the future seven years funding period. Um, that response uh, is done for example, through a dedicated uh, fund, the Health EU fund, which will be much bigger than currently the case. Uh, there is an horizontal approach uh, through existing uh, funds um, that, uh, for example, the European Regional Development Fund uh, now can tackle health, the health sector through infrastructure support. Um, and uh, all that is backed politically by the Health Union which has been uh, announced by uh, Commission President uh, von der Leyen uh, recently. Uh, our focus uh, on those package uh, was to stress the gender perspective, because uh, we, we see that um, especially women are uh, most hit by, uh, by, by the crisis, uh, so uh, that negative uh, effects need to be countered. And we want to stress in particular uh, the, the care sector to be supported via EU funds. On climate uh, change, uh, we see hopefully in future, as Roku already uh, mentioned, a set of new tools uh, in favor of uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. And uh, those tools shall be enshrined in uh, the EU funds on all levels, starting from a strategic level um, during the program preparation and going down to uh, the level of a project selection where uh, climate proofing has to be uh, ensured. Furthermore, um, a minimum share has to be spent on climate action. Uh, this is uh, energy efficiency, uh, renewable energies, zero carbon economy, uh, and a lot of uh, more issues. And uh, most important probably is uh, a new targeted uh, instrument, the Just Transition Fund, uh, which is meant to support uh, regions most affected uh, by the energy transition and the phasing out uh, of, of coal. So we are quite confident that the, e, the new but EU budget and the new uh, funds will be more fit for purpose when it comes to uh, tackling uh, the climate crisis. Apart from these new elements, obviously uh, the, the regular uh, EU funding continues with the existing funds uh, and uh, we consider that they also continue to follow high investment standards. For example, in relation to pub public participation, audits and controls, fight against fraud and also respect for fundamental rights as enshrined in the EU Charter for Fundamental Rights. And those funding opportunities um, tackle job creation, support for SMEs, 
social inclusion, sustainable mobility, energy transition and circular economy. So a very broad range of issues that are that play a key role in our daily life. Um, as currently the case, we also see that uh, support for a sustainable urban development is uh, maintained uh, through a dedicated funding uh, stream. Minimum shares have to be spent for urban development. Uh, there will be more institutional approach towards uh, exchange of best practices, uh, also through concrete partnerships. Uh, there will be more capacity building both for the administration and for stakeholders and uh, um, authorities uh, shall have competences when it comes to the project selection. Uh, despite of all the good news, I hope, uh, certainly a lot of uh, difficulties uh, and challenges uh, remain. The involvement of partners uh, when it comes to EU funding is uh, nice to be read on paper, but often we see they remain a bit empty. Uh, and this is also because the Commission cannot really verify whether the involvement was done properly and too much uh, discretion is still left uh, to the Member States uh, to, well, to provide for the good setting. Uh, we also see that uh, cities are kind of the main target group to implement the European Green Deal. And uh, at the same time, uh, they do not have direct access to EU funding. So there's a bit of a mismatch and uh, we have not yet found uh, the good solution uh, to cope with that situation. And last point, the administrative burden. Um, the, the management uh, for the funds is quite heavy and uh, accessing the funds uh, from side of the beneficiaries is very burdensome. And uh, there are high administrative uh, hurdles, especially for small beneficiaries that prevent them from uh, participating in EU funding. And we still have to work on that in order to make it easier also for the smaller structures to benefit from the good opportunities. Thank you, um, Simone. Uh, I just uh, before we go to uh, to uh, the next speaker, uh, can can you tell us a few words on the co-financing of the plans? Yes. The idea behind is that uh, the union provides for the largest part of a project cost, whereas there's at the same time a need from national side for co-financing the costs of, uh, of a project. And there are different degrees of uh, co-financing uh, requirements, and this depends on the category of region. In short, the, the poorer a region is, the, the, less, the least developed, um, the smaller the share a region has to contribute for a project's cost. So um, in the least developed regions, that share is about 15%, whereas uh, the, the union provides for 85% of the project costs. And the richer a region, the higher its share it has to contribute. And this goes up to 40%. Excellent. Thank you. So maybe we will collect uh, the questions for uh, for the end. Uh, then, with pleasure, now we'd like to give uh, the floor to uh, Bernard Klaus Voss. Uh, so the floor is yours to explain to us how you see uh, these new developments and how you lead them also with your own uh, functions. Bernard. I think that we have a small technical problem, which we will try to solve it. And therefore, uh, maybe the easiest is we go straight to Annalisa and then we go back uh, to, to Bernard. Please, somebody should uh, help uh, help Bernard to, uh, mm. to be connected. OK, Please. again. Ah, he's back. Yeah, are you back? Okay, no. I we will, uh, we will, we, no problem. We will wait uh, for Ben, but uh, you just, uh, Annalisa, you take the floor. Okay. 
Thank you very much and really, really thank you for inviting me. I'm so happy uh, to meet you all, to be with uh, also the Deputy Mayor of Strasbourg. I can Strasbourg hear you. Is, uh, you can't hear me? Our, um, <laughs> we we yes. can hear you. Yes, we, we can, but you have to wait now. You will be the next, uh, the next on the list. Thank you. So go on, Annalisa. So, uh, so I'm very happy to be here with all of you, uh, Greens, but also local authorities, local politicians, and uh, Strasbourg is a member of ours, so I'm very happy to meet her. Um, so, maybe where, where does the debate stand uh, in Euro cities? Uh, we, because we only talk about that, I mean, it's normal. Uh, the pandemic has hit uh, very, very hard cities in particular, because a lot of the, the majority of the population is there. So the, the sort of uh, big crisis, call it, you know, economic, social and so on, is really concentrated there. So the pandemic has not only made the situation worse, it's also in a way uh, exposed and x-rayed, if we can say, the gaps and the weaknesses of the models and the, and the systems that were already in place. Yeah. So in in cities it's really really it's like doing an x-ray it's 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 incredible you see it and the the pandemic has made it uh, much bigger so that's one element and that comes out with a with a you know with so many mayors being completely worried about the situation because of their you know their, their cities um, you know depend on tourism you know culture all these all the sectors have been very much impacted so that's one thing. Having said that, uh, all of them, in any case, the majority that you know with whom we work in the network are saying COVID can be an agent of change. Funnily enough, <laughs> it is an agent of change if we all work together to make it an agent, an agent of change. So a lot of them really have gone into, and I've read a, an article this morning in the, on, on The Guardian uh, by Ada Colau from Barcelona just saying that, that, you know, ma mayors are seeing that as an opportunity to transform the city for the better, to exactly work on those weaknesses that were already there. So it's not only a matter of, uh, you know, reinventing or adjusting, it's really about rethinking. Either we transform or the sort of what we call the green transition even, if we stay with the same model, we'll see that it will fail because it will not have considered the sort of social element like it should be. So there is a need to change and min many, many mayors want to do it. They are in the sort of uh, um, political minded to, to wanting to do it. And they see it as an opportunity also because it is a way to also change the governance of their own uh, city in terms of, you know, building uh, back and rethinking systems with the population and with the local actors, so in, also in, in transforming the governance. Secondly, to experiment and innovate things. And third, to think of reforms that are not only on the urgency, but also on the long term. So that's really where we stand at the moment. But what they also say is that they cannot do it alone. Yeah, they need other levels of governance to be part of the game. So that's why we keep on saying solidarity, solidarity, solidarity in the sense of you can't, it's not time for vetoes <laughs> like it's happening for the budget. It's time for solidarity, it's time for unity, for cooperation, for it's it's for the good of everyone. So the multi-level governance element is huge. This needs to be re really, and, and, and in that respect, if we want to move things forward, we need to have cities, at least from our perspective, call them local authorities, original authorities, but anyway, representatives of citizens, those that work with citizens at the table, both of the EU policy making and in the case, for instance, of the recovery fund uh, at the national table. So at the moment, it's really that the big battle we are um, we are fighting. It's really about the partnership, the, the you know, having a, a seat at the table, making sure that, for instance, both in the we've heard uh, all the typologies of uh, funding from the two colleagues that have explained it really well. But like in the structural funds, the partnership principle is really weak. The, the parliament has pushed, but as um, as was said, as it was said, uh, you know, the commission 
Does, yeah, you, you said uh, doesn't have the means, or but they, they don't do it because they don't want to. They're, the masters is the council, is the member states. So why should they control the member states in the way they, you know, they involve uh, local authorities, for instance? So this is really the big, the big, uh, the big issue. If we don't work with local authorities, with the cities, uh, when designing all those programs the impact will not be there the sort of results will not be there the sort of reforms will not happen in the way we are uh, we are you know we are thinking and discussing about it so on the for instance on the recovery fund there is that we are we are doing a lot of um, uh, things for instance in terms of um, making a survey to collect uh, the experience of all the cities. We have quite a lot. We have 200 cities, more or less, in the in the organization, and we're asking: Are you being involved? What are you? You know, the sort of questions that could give us understanding also uh, what kind of gaps and needs uh, that are needed, or you know, what kind of um, you know, uh, how how do you what what kind of projects would you want to to achieve, uh, and and this kind of uh, you know, we want to make sure that. Uh, the the national recovery plan can really uh, make sense then on the ground for the citizens in the cities to 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 you know to achieve those reforms so that's really the the big battle we've discussed we are discussing with the parliament i think the parliament is really a, an ally in this respect uh, we had a discussion with the intergroup urban intergroup they're also you know very positive in this respect but we need uh, battles at the national levels with all the people involved in these kind of discussions i know that in italy for instance the the, the ministry is working with the national association of uh, local authorities with the metropolitan cities to understand you know at least to understand and to try and collect their needs and so on but other countries much less and so on so this i think we need some political action at all levels to make sure that this make otherwise it will be a missed opportunity now that's that's for the recovery fund and it's a whole you know building site as uh, you say in french but in uh, in um, in the in the structural funds is also but that's let's say more uh, you know it's already existing and so on so it's a matter of making sure that uh, the regional authorities for instance understand that you know the partnership principles should be enhanced even more now there is a need to you really support the cities even more than before. So that that's the thing. And for the direct, um, let's say direct programs that Rocco also mentioned, I think we've seen and we are seeing and we hope that for I think that new, uh, you know, new MFF is a really good opportunity in this respect. There are so many areas where we can really have an impact. I mean, I'm thinking of green procurement green and social procurement i mean there the potential is huge and there are direct um, you know fundings with digigrow or with uh, even uh, will be horizon europe or now with horizon 2020 where there have been very good experiences in experimentations as well in terms of using for instance uh, in transforming construction sites into totally uh, you know, eco construction sites with an, without noise, without pollution, and so on. There is a, a lot of work on terms of urban regen regeneration and how to transform. You know, with the renovation wave, that's a huge opportunity. So it's not only a matter of funding; it's also a matter of the Green Deal stream of legislation that is, uh, you know, coming out and that will uh, uh, represent a fundamentally uh, a fundamental basis for. Uh, uh, allowing the transformation in the cities on the ground and so on. So it's there that we need to uh, make sure that the sort of foundations are uh, correct. Otherwise, when they come to the ground, they won't be uh, feasible. So this, this uh, let's say, um, alignment between the policies and the and the and the calls and the programs and the funding is very very important. And and you know I. I can go on with examples and examples of, you know, uh, how you transform a city into a circular city or you work on waste uh, uh, things or in financing the, the how do you say, the energy transition. You know, we can talk forever, urban mobility. There are so many areas in a cities where EU funding can really help 
to trigger what the national uh, can add and what the local, of course, can do within their own uh, means, but also the private. I mean, so we need to think of, uh, you know, systemic transformations that can allow as well integrated uh, channeling of funds and investments. That's the way forward, because otherwise it's, uh, it's we're going to continue investing in se separate, uh, how do you say, sectors, uh, and then the games will be, you know, separated games and so on so it's it's really a shift that we need to take that's why I'm, i like to talk about covid 19 as an agent of change because it's it's a it's really a good opportunity but i don't want to take too much time i mean i, I could just talk forever and i don't want to no, it's, monopolize it's, the discussion yes, i hope it's what you were expecting i don't know I can... yeah absolutely absolutely um also because you are um you mentioned two issues which are very relevant uh, as we know uh there is a fight at the european council that also colleagues mentioned uh, blocking, uh, let's say, the agreement on the MFF and on the recovery fund. And this, uh, um, uh, this fight, it takes place these days. And we will see uh, in the European Council the 10th of uh, uh, December if uh, uh, we will be able and Europe will be able to uh, to really uh, solve the blackmail problem of uh, Hungary and uh, Poland, which in an unacceptable way, they are blocking the agreement in such a difficult period just because at that moment they do not want to have nothing to do with the rule of law and conditionality. I mean, that's why also I mentioned in the beginning we are facing incredible difficult times. And we know also for these countries where there are a lot of problems of democracy, and we spoke about, about that, Annalisa, that we, um, let's say, we also tried politically as a group in the European Parliament to uh, go for the direct financing to the cities uh, and not really to go via urban or via others and therefore um, we didn't manage yet but one day uh, we will manage because uh, I we continue the battle <laughs> absolutely we have to continue the battle also because uh, uh, it is clear that for uh, a lot of years uh, we uh, face such a tension between uh, who gets the money are the regions is the government, is the local level, and without a real political plan. And always with just this idea that we own this money, we can do whatever we want. And I must say that at least now we have to admit that van der Leyen make the difference compared to the previous um, uh, presidents of the commission from Juncker, but also twice Barroso, which he sold completely out the structural funds and the budget to the member states without having any kind of control and monitoring on the spending of this money. But now the situation is really turning because of the of the uh, Green Deal, because of, uh, let's say, the commitment also that the European Commission took we, because of us, that this cannot be uh, just a a free card and do whatever you want without having a political coherence and also uh, an, an attention to the sustainable development. But we will come back afterwards because indeed what I would like also to come out from this session is to show that indeed, as colleagues said, we can make the difference. Now they cannot do business as usual. They have to deliver on sustainable development, on jobs, on health, on, uh, on, on environment. So I don't know if we are back with Bern, if uh, you are connected uh, and you can uh, take the floor now. Bern? Not really, so, but we will wait. So I will propose that we go now to Magdalena, which uh, she can really bring uh, to the panel her um, experience from very concrete, uh, let's say, uh, confrontation with such a situation. So Magdalena, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vula, and um, many greetings to everyone who has joined the meeting today. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'd like to confirm what Annalisa said before me, and that is that after the initial shock, I think I know many mayors who actually 
do perceive the COVID crisis as an opportunity to start anew. And there is um, this great hope that European Union and the, the Corona um, Recovery Plan and the green, the green Deal could all come together to actually fulfill our green values. Um, what I start to feel, however, um, from a position of a, a state who is in uh, that kind of uh, ex-communism uh, state, and um, that's why I would like to focus on the modernization funds today, is um, there is a lot of pressure to somehow um, redirect uh, those funds from the areas where we would like to see it as green mayors to um, the big players. And um, just to, to give you an overview, because there's a lot of different funds, um, I will just give you a very short um, brief on the modernization fund, because it is a dedicated funding program to support the 10 lower income EU member states. Um, it is, um, Czech Republic belongs uh, to them. There's also Bulgaria, Croatia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Estonia, Hungary, Romania, and Slovakia. For the Czech Republic, just to give you an idea, uh, we are expected to receive somewhere between 4.5 to 5.6 billion euros and in the period of 2021 to 2030 um, towards tackling the partial climate goals um, in 2030 and then re finally reaching the climate neutrality in 2050. However, there's only currently 1.5%, which is uh, equaling 87 million euros allocated to community energy projects. And the reason I'm talking about it, because uh, as a green mayor, I see the community energy projects as the tool uh, towards um, not just tackling climate change on a local level, but also as a tool uh, towards resilience uh, on that very front line uh, where the government meets its citizens. The remaining 80, uh, sorry, 98.5% is supposed to be directed towards big players who are now mainly the coal powered heat and electricity production uh, players. And uh, as much as we respect the fact that, of course, um, that transition has to be done on that level because they are the, the biggest polluters and, and it has to change. I think that if this opportunity of the re Corona Recovery Plan and Green Deal did not go um, the way where we can make communities, towns and cities independent and more resilient, that would be a huge mistake and opportunity missed. Um, to give you a little bit of background, uh, and I think Czech Republic uh, will have many similarities with other ex-communist countries. Um, the the problem of the countries that are supposed to receive the funding from the uh, from the modernization fund is that uh, the towns still heavy um, still carry a heavy burden from the communism era, uh, roughly from the 1948 till 89, um, during which uh, there hasn't been proper maintenance of um, the, all the possessions that the town had mainly mainly buildings because um, if you may recall everything belonged to everyone so actually no one looked after anything and uh, the problem is that the, the debt is still very deep and widespread. Uh, I have inherited a town where we still have buildings from the 60s that were built at the time just for temporary use for 10 years and we're still using them today uh, and they haven't really been very well maintained um, for that period of 40 years. And I think that is the difference between uh, the towns and cities in the West where perhaps, you know, you can have one generation of politicians for four or eight years who decide this is not my priority and I will invest elsewhere um, from the this communism era where you have had that approach for 40 years. And 40 years is a long time to neglect something and you will have to pay a price for it. Therefore, uh, and I'm stressing this because now when we are at the 
um, basically at the beginning of a new funding period for 2021 to uh, 2027, um, we are in a position where there's so many different projects that we need to tackle. Um, just to give you an idea, um, Nushek, where I'm a mayor, uh, there's a 60, sorry, uh, 6,000 uh, inhabitants uh, who live here. The town owns 16 buildings and they're all old uh, and at the verge of you know, some sort of major issue. I'm actually sitting in one. This is the, the municipal uh, council um, building where we have major structural issues and we need insulation and energy consumption optimization and so on and so on. And this is applicable to all our school buildings and to our um, building for the senior housing, uh, to our firefighters, um, to our libraries. Each of these 16 buildings is in need of major reconstruction towards um, uh, saving CO2 and making uh, energy um, uh, consumption um, optimized so that we don't waste energy. And also, of course, uh, some sort of uh, self-generation um, of energy in terms of community uh, projects. And at the moment, uh, we've only had one successful project that we have actually performed, and that was um, an insulation of our firefighter uh, station. Um, and uh, you may ask why so little like you know why have we used in the last seven years only uh, one uh, funding opportunity and that is because the level of support is extremely low uh, the um, at the moment the, the support that we get from the Czech government as a redistribution of that money uh, towards climate goals uh, is somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of being covered by the funding and therefore the remaining 80 to 60 percent has to be covered by the town and um, you can imagine that if that was one uh, building maybe we would manage but if we have 16 of them it's absolutely impossible uh, for us to um, transform our city towards something that is um, uh, being in line with uh, with climate uh, tackle and all the um, all the goals that we have. It, it's um, just a a goal that is uh, far too big. And um, when you have a look at the um, the whole situation in the Czech Republic, uh, we have roughly six thousand municipalities, and only forty five of those have some sort of renewable source of energy, uh, and those are usually you know, some sort of um, um, solar panels. Uh, there's two um, places where they actually have biogas stations that are using uh, uh, communal household waste, um, while, in my opinion, they should be basically one in each region because there's such a huge waste going on um, in our uh, waste management. So um, what we really need um, as mayors is to reduce our mandatory expenses to, and if you are focused on the energy transition, it really needs to be minimizing the energy waste and um, improving the efficiency of uh, heating and cooling of our buildings and uh, increasing um, the our own energy production from renewable resources via community energy projects. Um, and uh, this is exactly what is not quite happening or has not been happening in the in the past funding and. I have great hope that it, it will improve in the next um, period of 2021 to 27. However, there are signs that um, the, the the parties who are now um, in power, and you all know that our Prime Minister Andrei Babic is in great conflict of interest and is redirecting funds towards his own companies. But there are also other parties who are very likely to succeed in the next election in 2021 who in the past have been traditionally against any kind of environmental investments. And these parties are now extremely interested in governing the, the environmental agenda. We have just had regional elections where one of these um, kind of um, right-hand parties um, have tried in many different regions to acquire agenda of national environment um, in their own portfolio, which is unheard of. In the past, they have never been interested. And the only reason why are they interested now is because they sense there will be money coming from the European Union and they want to redirect that money towards their own goals and towards their needs. And, and yeah, I perceive that as um, a huge danger. And um, uh, I'm still not sure 
what can be done about it uh, other than some sort of dialogue with uh, everyone in the European Union who is actually in in charge of funding uh, and um, try to, as Wula said, try to also redirect some of the funding directly towards towns and cities rather than sending everything through the member states because uh, of these issues on a governmental level. I will leave it there and if anyone has any questions, I'll be more than happy uh, to answer. Thank you very, very much. And indeed, um, Magdalena, you touch uh, uh, the, the, the elephant in the room, which is uh, also how much uh, money they have been spent around uh, old energies, uh, for example, uh, um, Germany, Italy, uh, France collectively spent 44 billion of, uh, of, uh, of euros on fossil uh, uh, fuels during the coronavirus period instead of uh, uh, 29 billion when it comes to clean energy. Uh, so there we are realizing that these are statistics from the Columbia University and also the Sustainable uh, Institute and uh, Environment Institute of Stockholm. So this shows that uh, we are far away of reaching what we want uh, because indeed one of the questions also that uh, some of our people mention now is uh, how much, let's say, how much direct funding for cities uh, and funding for degrowth in energy consumption and energy efficiency. Uh, but maybe uh, Roku and Simone, you write it down so we will be able to reply to this question immediately uh, after. Um, but uh, uh, I would like to give now the floor to Julia, hoping that we will be able at a certain moment to get uh, Bernard back. Uh, but uh, Julia, the floor is yours. And uh, again, congratulations for your uh, election uh, and for the success you had in France. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me today. Uh, I have been learning a lot during the session so far. So thank you for all the other speakers. Uh, before I share the perspective of Strasbourg on the use of EU funds at the local level and the role of green mayors, uh, let me just tell you that it's only been five months uh, that I am in office as deputy mayor in charge of European and international affairs. And uh, so I'm still learning a lot and I'm on the topic of today and I'm far from being an expert. I anyways do hope that our experience and point of view will be a useful input to this session. Uh, so first, what is our perspective on the use of EU funds in Strasbourg? Um, several of you have already spoken about it. The, the COVID-19 pandemic has um, had a huge impact and it has um, increased social inequalities and highlighted the need to speed up the democratic, social and green transformations. Uh, these uh, transitions, which are all complementary, are at the core of our municipal program with the new green mayor of Strasbourg, Jean Barcegion. The transition towards a more democratic, socially just and greener future will not be possible without significant investments. This has already been said also. Um, so we do urgently need to make the best use possible of EU funds for our city's projects. To apply to EU funding does not only mean that we extend our financial capacities, it also means that we connect our public policies with the European agenda and it implies strong partnerships with other cities as there are some fundings links to working in networks and exchanging best practices. I would like to say that I'm delighted to have heard Annalisa Boni's perspective on this topic as we aim to be more active in Euro cities, also to meet potential partners and exchange about existing opportunities linked to EU funds. Uh, let me now present uh, some priorities of Strasbourg political agenda that we hope will benefit from EU funds. The majority of these investments are targeting the implementation of the ecological transition, without surprise. Uh, we want to renovate uh, more than 8,000 apartments and buildings uh, a year in order to reduce what uh, I think in English is called energy poverty and to improve access to decent housing for people with low incomes. Uh, through these reno renovations, we also aim to create many local jobs in the renovating sector while considerably reducing our carbon emissions. 
Another aim is to invest in ecological transport to reduce territorial inequalities by developing a new metropolitan train in the metropolitan area around Strasbourg and further, further develop the existing tramway lines. We also intend to strengthen our position as France's leading bicycle city and continue developing our bicycle network. Also, we intend to invest heavily with the support of the European Green Deal strategy and programs in carbon neutral mobility solutions. This means offering the inhabitants of Strasbourg as many alternatives as possible to the use of a private car. Our objective is to reduce CO2 emissions by 40% by 2030 and reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Having carbon neutral vehicles for the city administration is also an ongoing project. Of course, uh, renewable energy is also a key topic for us and we are developing a cross-border project with the German city of Kehl by recovering waste heat from a steel work to heat housing districts in Strasbourg. A small part of this project is already supported by the Interreg program, but we hope that additional EU funds will be able to support this innovative and iconic project. Uh, we will rely on cohesion policy funds and recovery plans to fund these projects, but we also want to use EU flagship se sectorial programs uh, such as Horizon Europe, LIFE, Interreg, Erasmus to support our local policies. We are especially interested in the new Horizon Europe mission and will hopefully benefit from this program despite the high level of competition. I have shown how EU funds represent an essential opportunity in order to implement our political agenda. I now would like to quickly mention what are the present obstacles to make it a real challenge and that make it a real challenge to access these funds. Um, uh, Simone has talked about the administrative burden and um, exactly in that way, the, the main obstacle is, is really uh, for us, lack of manpower and skills in our city administrations in order to apply to the funds, but also manage them. Uh, we also need to raise awareness concerning the multiple possibilities these funds represent amongst the municipal councillors in charge of different thematic sectors. So it's not just the administration that needs to be um, more like aware, but also the, the politic politicians. Um, last but not least, we need an efficient representation in Brussels to lobby for projects and applications and identify which EU funds are the issues. As you probably know, um, and this was already said by Vula, the last municipal elections in France in June of this year has been characterized by a vague verte, a green wave, uh, that allowed green mayors to access power in many important cities in France, such as Bordeaux, Lyon or Strasbourg, to only list a few. Um, a role of a green mayor uh, and its green team, because of course the mayor is never alone, <laughs> is to creatively and efficiently tackle the three main challenges of our time, which are to limit our impact on and to adapt to climate change, to enhance social justice and make our democracies more inclusive and get citizens as involved as possible. In Strasbourg specifically, the role of a green mayor is also to strengthen the cross-border cooperation as env environmental problems do not ever stop as at national borders and need to be addressed in a common strategy with our German neighbors. This is for instance, the case for air or water pollution. Our goal as a green team in charge of managing a European capital is also to become an exemplary city in the field of ecological transition on the European and even international level. As mentioned before, we want to actively engage in a dialogue with our present and future partner cities about what are the most effective policies to overcome our common global challenges. This implies importing public policies that have proven their efficiency elsewhere, but also exporting innovative projects that we have developed in Strasbourg. Thank you for your attention. And if there's any questions, I'll be delighted to answer them. 
Thank you very much, uh, Julia, not only for uh, the very good ideas, but also for your English, which is, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, let's say, not every day to find French. <laughs> with such I'm, I'm, also, I'm also German, as you hear yeah. from my accent, yeah, yeah, so I, know, I don't. <laughs> So multilingualism. So congratulations! And uh, before we try again to give the floor to uh, Bernd, um, I wanted only to say that indeed there is a difference in the system, and Simone will clearly indicate that because in France you have much more regionalized system in the decision making than in. Uh, Czech Republic, but where everything is understood, Magdalena is much more concentrated, and therefore not only bureaucracy, but also the decision-making system makes, uh, if I understood you well, Magdalena, uh, the whole process much more complicated than uh, than the rest. So I will uh, um, give, uh, let's say, Bernd. Maybe now, if we even if we don't see you, maybe we will be able to hear you. The floor is yours. Um, any chance? Yeah, I think that we have uh, a problem with that, but let's then maybe uh, go on a little bit with uh, uh, the questions and then we will see if at the end we will have the chance to to get burn on, uh, on, on the panel. So indeed, one of the questions that uh, we had uh, um, received is exactly the, uh, let's say, fi finding founding, uh, the degrowth in energy consumption and also the energy efficiency. Uh, so maybe uh, Simone and Teroku, you can uh, uh, reply to this question. Do you see from what exactly you are uh, working for the moment that uh, there is a real push for, uh, uh, for uh, the, um, let's say, the, the the energy efficiency uh, and also uh, what's energy. happening why it doesn't work i telephone every day 12 hours and more uh, sorry Bern, yes but uh, yes okay okay let's see burn we are burned we are uh, we hear you okay Let's uh, let's wait and uh, maybe Simone and Roku, could you help us to reply to this uh, to this question? Energy efficiency and renewables, and uh, and how much really uh, the European Union is pushing for that? Simone. Yes, I can start. Um, I actually tried to answer uh, to the question in the uh, in the chat. I'm not sure if this was uh, successful. Um, anyway, um, uh, so the answer uh, would be, uh, well, in part, yes, but uh, the growth as such is not the concept that is, uh, let's say, followed by, by the funds. Uh, and in particular, when it comes to the Just Transition Fund, it is more about um, diversification of the economy and not of the economic model or of the economic system and this would uh, this is what would be required if we go for degrowth so uh, i think um degrowth is partly addressed uh, when we speak about energy efficiency and resource uh, efficient uh, measures that are going to play a role uh, in eu funding and also um uh, when when it comes to to circular uh, economy, so uh, it's clearly the objective uh, to uh, to follow, let's say, the hierarchy of uh, of the circular economy. So to avoid waste, to recycle waste, to reuse use waste. Um, this is all part of EU funding, but uh, it's uh, it's not a change of uh, of the economic thinking of the economic uh, model. This uh, needs to be said uh, very clearly. Thank you, Simone Roku. Yes, I just want to add one one reflection. Is indeed the degrowth is still not on the table, also because this is still not uh, won ideologically uh, at the EU level. But however, there is a shift. If we look at over the last 10 years, from Barroso to Juncker to von der Leyen, uh, at the EU level, there is a shift. 
I mean, 10 years ago, we only talked about economy, uh, macroeconomic conditionality, austerity. Then with Juncker, we moved slightly to investment. It was rather private investment backed by public money, but private investment. And now we are talking about public investment, a recovery plan. And again, as I mentioned, the climate share has increased. Now we're talking, talking about biodiversity, but also interestingly, what is not climate should not harm the climate, should not harm the biodiversity. While before there was a share for climate, but if with 80% you destroy more than what you build with 20% makes no sense. So now we have what we call the taxonomy regulation, which is in a way to have a regulation and the spending in line with Paris Agreement, to put it really in a nutshell. And we have what we call the do not uh, significantly harm. So there is a slight shift. We have not reached the point we want to see where we start the growth. We start thinking about this, but we are clearly changing from austerity-based logic, macroeconomic sanction-based logic to a, a public uh, investment towards climate with less damage on the climate. And we know that we are running out of time, so it's maybe not strong enough, but there is a change. So on the growth, we are not yet there, but there is a shift over the last 10 years, clearly. Yes, Raku, and really uh, thanks a lot, both of you, because uh, indeed uh, um, I think that you brought uh, uh, these two elements, these two principles, which are extremely important. Uh, the taxonomy, uh, which we had also the Green Rapporteur with a very big Greek success, uh, which was a uh, uh, is but uh, ache out, uh, which de facto uh, means uh, to track. Uh, to make the track on the ecological expenditure. So practically to, uh, to be able to, um, uh, to check uh, that uh, um, what is truly green expenditure. And this is with this system, uh, somehow with this methodology, uh, we will try to face full of uh, contradictions. And of course, as you mentioned, uh, the application of uh, do not harm principle, uh, which means, uh, as uh, you said, no investments undermining the Green Deal, because we have done that for decades. And now at least there, there is this pressure that we cannot be completely contradicting each other. And therefore, we are going to the right direction. But of course, there is, there is uh, let's say, long way to go and uh, not to make it too political, our presence in these negotiations is extremely important to keep, uh, let's say, the political coherence that it is not only the blah, blah and the greenwashing, but also are very, very, very concrete, uh, mm, let's say, legislation which will uh, re reduce the space uh, for maneuvering and for all the uh, policies uh, that we faced uh, until, uh, until now. Um, before we continue, because we have 12 more minutes, I would like to try for the last time uh, for uh, uh, Bern. So um, can you really hear us? Could you, could you really take part of the discussion? I can hear you. You can hear me too? Yes, here we are. OK. Well, it Thank seemed you. to be a black Saturday. We Normal, are very I, happy. Very happy. Normal, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the invitation, Norman. I speak 12 hours per day and more with my laptop, but today it does not work. And thank you for the chance to speak here today on behalf of the Green, um, as a Green member from Schleswig-Holstein, the Northern country from um, Germany and member of parliament there. And in the behalf of the Green group of the Committee of Region since uh, January this year, um, the Green have a group, an own group in the Committee of Region, and co-president is Satu Hapanen from Finland. And uh, it was good luck that Simone Reinhardt, uh, commit, Reinhardt's commitment as uh, we as a representatives on municipal cities and region from all over Europe were able to organize, organize effective political work for the Greens so very, very quickly on this level, special under the situation on Corona. This gives a great chance to promote green positions, local, green and regional authorities on the European level. And like Magdalena 
uh, already said there it's interesting how many people are suddenly friends of green deal that's good but uh, often it seems to be a little bit sort of greenwashing let me tell two things one perhaps first um, the work in the committee of region and uh, second some parts uh, of political question from my region. The Committee of Region is the voice, you know, of regions and city <laughs> in the EU and advice on new laws that have impact on regional and on regions and cities. One of the tasks of the core is to ensure sub subsidiarity, that every task is assigned it to the government agency where it is best carried out. In our understanding, however, this means that the EU-specific goals that they are implemented in the best possible way on the side via directives and regulation. But that must also be ensured uh, that the community of Europe, of course, this also applies to funds, financial resources. And in the core, we have the regional hub uh, network, 36 regions are member there up to now, uh, where we look very exactly how it works, how um, regulations work and how the money went to the regions. And you know, in fact, 70% of EU legislation concern regions and cities. Especially since cities and regions hold a great potential for event uh, for innovation, you know, and let me give you one example of the core. There we have a Green Deal going local working group, new and work very near together with the commission to bring Green Deal to the cities and to the regions. One task of this work group was to collect best practice and samples and we got very quick more than 200 and let me say some examples from my region. There's in one way a lot of SME, SMEs uh, who work on the field of green hydrogen and produce green hydrogen along the supply chain. They are the pioneers and they um, they do it in the in the outbacks with the money from the EU, the money from different uh, opportunities that that they get in Germany and from their own risk. And I have examples from a village in the north of Schleswig-Holstein. It's a village near the frontier to Denmark. Nowhere in Germany are so many e-cars up to now, like in that village. And the village has uh, a network for heating from biogas, but the network uh, in that village is active since uh, the 19th, 1919th, producing renewable energy. Engage citizens uh, who work there and engage regional policy. Other examples is a historic small city near the North Sea where they take heat from a print uh, from print works and uh, store it to the winter. And another is the island of Pervorm in the North Sea. It's an early eco island where they now have the new concept uh, for smart energy on, on the island. All of this, not just a question of money, but uh, committed citizens and local politicians and a regularity framework that makes it possible. Projects which shows who Green Deal could um, could look like on the local level. What is next regarding to the Green Deal? In the, uh, to establish lasting and constructive approach feedback circles such as the, confer as the conference of the future of Europe, uh, of, of Europe, but focus on the Green Deal. That could be one key. Today, Today, events is a good example too. It would be great help if the green work very closely together in this, on, very closely together on this on all levels. Each and every one of us is an ambassador of the Green Deal in his or her own region. I think that's very important to work in this way. Today, focus on the EU funds for social ecological transition. So I will speak uh, on the funding perspective in more details. 
it is important when we are looking to the funding criteria. And like Magdalena already said, a lot of criteria uh, have to be in exactly that the money goes. Uh, goes down to the cities and municipalities. It may happen that national government is not really following EU values regarding democracy, right, and participation. But at the same time, the democratic participation structures of local, regional, and, auto uh, and authorities who are responsible for the project may be good. If that is the case, that rich and cities should still have direct access to funding, to EU funding. I think that's very important. It is not our interest that funding structures allow national government to block money and the consequence process from their cities and regions. Cooperation should root to active subsidiarity, promote multi-level governance. On the way around LRR, LRA should be enabled to contribute the development of relevant initiatives in the line with the principle of active subsidiarity. And uh, during the German representative, there were some very good, I think, very good opinions that were made by the core. Uh, I will not go now to the details. But at all, I think it was uh, very important that the work was done and it showed very clear uh, that it's important that we get direct money for regions and cities and municipalities from European funds so that the work, not only uh, the work too, went quicker. Meanwhile, regarding the Green Deal, there are this moment three priorities. We will work together with the Commission. That's a priority of renewable renovation waves, that's the priority of sustainable mobility, mobility and uh, urban, urban greening, climate adaption. But uh, from our point of view, this plan priorities and beyond that rapid expansion of renewable energy should be given great importance. We currently have 60% of our energy renewable up to now. The rest is fossil, is nuclear, and we want to create 100% by 2050. And that's a long way. And I think um, we have to pressure, to pressure much more. In my region, it's a region where we produce already a lot of renewable energy. In the electricity sector, we are at 150% percent and we want to be 2025 300 percent that seems to be a lot but you must also see that uh, you must also see that we have to produce for hamburg too that's the one part in the other part we have um, only in the heating sector 15 16 percent nearly nothing and denmark on the other side of the of the frontier that has better regular since some uh, 30, 20 years, they have already more than 60 percent. And I think that too shows how important how important regulars are. I will not know. Yes, yeah? indeed. Uh, I'm really sorry because uh, it's not very kind. But uh, the problem is that uh, we I will say we have maximum seven minutes and i receive a few questions which uh, i really feel that we have to respond <laughs> and i'm really sorry for that but uh, with all these technical problems it's really difficult to give you more time but uh, i really think that is great news that uh, you have this uh, uh, group uh, in the committee of the regions because you can play a huge role also when it comes to exactly the issues you mentioned the direct funding and also the direct participation and the promotion of the green deal and you mentioned burned uh, very well also the issue of the conference of future for europe which will start beginning of next year i hope we will be able to conclude on the setting because uh, that will be a great opportunity also to continue to lobby on what the citizens need and the citizens needs to become closer to the institutions and therefore also to the founding and to the different opportunities because uh, uh, if not everything becomes more bureaucratic and more personal and more complicated but 
I would like to give the floor to Annalisa because one of uh, the people uh, asked, uh, uh, because Julia mentioned that they need an office in Brussels to lobby, then uh, people are asking if you have already the EU institutions there. Uh, I mean, what lobby you want and how smaller cities, as in the case of Magdalena, they will survive if, <laughs> even if they are not the Strasbourg city. So could you let us a little bit know, can you re reply to this question? Or, uh, yeah, I think with your position, you are the right person to, to answer. The floor is yours. We have five Thank more you. minutes. And yeah. um, very quickly, I, very yeah. quickly, yes, very quickly. And so I'm very happy to to know, to get to know you. And uh, I, I would uh, I would be very happy to meet you very soon, so that we can understand how we can actually support you more uh, directly with the you know with the needs you have. In terms that we also support cities in their uh, consortium, you know, consortia making. So it's more about. Uh, making sure that you have a strong administration in Strasbourg and uh, you invest in creating capacities in Strasbourg and in, uh, you know, reinforcing the, uh, the political European capacity rather than having someone in uh, in Brussels that will solve the problem because if you have someone in the in Brussels that sends plenty of opportunities but your administration is not ready to absorb, digest and use the, the opportunities then you are square you you go back to the you know like monopoly going back uh, home <laughs> so i think there's a, we can have a chat i've been in local governments regional governments european government for all my life talking about european affairs and trying to use europe to even strengthen the capacity of local authorities so i am, i know exactly the the situation which you are it's not you 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 are a very good administration already in in terms of european uh, positioning so there's you can you can maybe better use the network than what you do today rather than invest money in uh, having someone in Strasbourg which could come in Brussels which could come maybe a bit later if you want yeah and, uh, and of just course, to answer yeah, quickly it's yes. also about uh, of course um, promoting the european parliament in strasbourg it's not just about new uh, funds yeah we got it we got okay it. that's another point okay we can't do that <laughs> you're right if we start this discussion now we will not end the next two hours but uh, so there is an, another question which uh, is uh, um let's say maybe for magdalena but also for you julia uh, how uh, the cities are involved uh, in uh, the national contribution to reach the climate goals uh, so the whole discussion around uh, had the cop 26 do you have uh, any active role uh, together with the national authorities to discuss how to reach these goals or uh, that is only on paper and not de facto in reality so maybe magdalena start with you yes very quickly um it is first of all voluntary and second of all it's on paper so um we are basically trying to uh, and now I'm talking for my little uh, town. We're trying to join the uh, what we call the Agenda 21, which is basically the sustainable development uh, platform for for towns, and it already has um, climate change issues incorporated. Um, but overall, I feel that um, the real um, involvement of municipalities on the lowest level, and that's starts with communication with citizens and um, basically running um, good uh, campaigns to understand how important um, climate change mitigation adaptation is, that is just not happening. Um, uh, and I mean, sometimes it's happening if you have a um, administration or a leadership of the town who uh, think it's important and they explain it with certain uh, projects. That's that's not the same as as running a campaign which basically gets everyone on the same level of understanding. Mm -hmm. But uh, Simone and Roku, do we have still the opportunity um, to influence the regulations and the discussions that all these questions around bureaucracy, all these difficulties also to involve in a more active way the local uh, level? Do, we, do you see any still margin 
to improve uh, this part because of course this is also uh, one of the, the the clear issues that they are coming from the discussion uh, so uh, 30 seconds each simone yeah, thanks. Um, no, uh, so let me be short. Uh, for the regulations, no, we are at final stage. Uh, this kind of uh, improvement uh, would come uh, too late. However, there will be improvements anyway uh, for, for the next uh, generation. That's our hope. Um, and um, it has been done a lot in terms of uh, cutting red tape. And we really hope that this will mater materialize in the next funding period. Thank you. Uh, Roku? Uh, I would say theoretically yes, but unlikely for the recovery plan because it's being negotiated for the moment and our group was the only one in the parliament asking for direct access for cities to the recovery plan. Uh, it was part of the parliament's position, but with the council, the problem is we are talking to member states and they don't have any interest of uh, involving uh, cities directly or regional authorities. So I would say theoretically yes, but I think it's unlikely the negotiations are going to be closed in the next week slash uh, days, weeks. Uh, however, but if this does not necessarily help, then it will be up to the national governments to present their plan. So it's up to them to include or not. So of course it's not binding and we know that in certain countries like France, uh, the, the, the central governments are really centralistic, so it might be more difficult than in other member states. But in theory, there's still a room, a room of maneuver uh, in the national plans, even if it's um, what uh, what I would like in any case as a conclusive uh, point, because we could uh, the, the the discussion is really interesting, and I'm very pleased uh, that uh, we uh, met uh, here. Also, I am uh, I am convinced that with the European Green Party, as you know, we have a very active uh, local councillors network. Uh, we uh, create uh, where uh, Michael Berg, uh, your co-chair, together with Evelina, uh, the co-chair of the the European Green Party are working on that, but I think that uh, we need to continue this discussion and especially uh, make sure that in the coming months also with the presence of Bern in the, uh, in the Committee of Regions, we reinforce this, uh, let's say, networking because even if the regulations are what they are, we have still, let's say, in the right implementation the possibility to put pressure to the European Commission to help us for a more, uh, let's say, fair, but also a, a more, uh, let's say, inclusive process uh, during uh, this uh, period. We are talking about huge amounts of money. We are talking about huge opportunities. Maybe you did not even, for the non-experts, uh, understood that now health sector is financed you, Simone, you even mentioned infrastructures. It means really that with all these new opportunities we have, we will not face what we faced during this pandemic, where uh, because, of, uh, because of the national choices, because of the austerity measures, the system of health was really not able to face such a dramatic period we faced with the COVID. But now there is time to recover for very practical and concrete projects. And uh, I am sure that once uh, this MFF recovery and all these negotiations will be over, also at the level of the group with the colleagues and with Bern, we will discuss what we can produce in order to, without promising nothing because they will kill me, but let's say what kind of documentation also we can uh, produce in order to uh, make sure that uh, that will be helpful for the coming uh, for the coming years. Of course, we will have the opportunity to be uh, in contact. Uh, Annalisa, I'm sure we will meet one day and I uh, hope soon. And we will go to Strasbourg, Julia. Don't worry. I mean, if things are <laughs> coming back to track, uh, we have a calendar to follow. So we will meet each other um, very, very soon. I would like once more to um, thank everybody from Magdalena to Annalisa to Simone to Julia to Rocco to Bern, despite the technical difficulties, but of course also to the team in the European Green Party and also to my own uh, team uh, for making this session happen. And um, thanks again and all the best uh, and uh, good luck. 
Thank you.